This video was originally recorded August 2018 at the home of Robert and Nena Thurman in Woodstock, New York. Show your support and be sure to like this video and subscribe to the Tibet House US YouTube channel. Your online participation can help make a difference. Thanks for watching. Okay, so hi everybody. Uh, how are you? This is uh, me, <laughs> whatever that is. And uh, I'm in a good mood today because I read a nice article about myself and my beloved wife and our life's work. And um, I guess my ego got a little bit involved, so I'm feeling good. But uh, I don't know which ego. That's a Bob Thurman ego, I guess. But, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in uh, Tibetan Buddhism, which, like uh, Indian Buddhism, especially for in the first millennium of the common era for 1,000 years, the conscious knowledge about the ego, about the self, about the I, about the aham, which is Sanskrit for, for I, aham, is so subtle and profound. And, uh, and I always laugh when Western critical religious scholars make a big thing about, oh, it's a biography or autobiography, and they're building their reputation, or they're doing this or doing that. And, you know, like they're a bunch of natives or something. They're acting, you know, what they think of as natives. Actually, indigenous people are also much more sophisticated than they know. But anyway, these, especially these people in this tradition, they're completely self-conscious about the process of self-construction, the process of identity construction, identity habits, identity cultivation, identity transformation, based on knowledge of identitylessness and visceral experience of identitylessness. And furthermore, cultures touched by this tradition, they are all, even the simple people, they are affected by this and they have a flexibility and resilience of identity that is different from cultures which teach kind of rigid ego. And you should just be this because you're in this caste or this class or you're this gender or you're this whatever it is. There, uh, it's just it's just sad that there's still the planet is still divided in this way, and that people don't understand this process. Modern critical sociological people don't understand it. Some people, some some sort of bad guy types, do of course understand it, in the sense that, for example, this the philosopher of Putin, whose name is Dugin Alexander. Alexander Dugan. He does understand it, and he has a philosophy about that the devil is this flexibility of identity. So he's the old-fashioned Western thing that if you feel some inner flexibility and sensibility, it has to be Satan. It has to, which actually makes you feel better when you're more open in your core. When you're more open-hearted, we have these expressions, open-hearted, open-minded, you have an open identity, well, that, that's beyond us. We don't have that expression, but that is the right expression, actually, if we, our psychology was really clear, it was deeper, if we, which it will be as we meet more with the, with the Buddhist philosophy, enlightenment, let's call it, or Buddhist psychology. Uh, that does make you feel better, but making you feel better is bad for these kind of violent, vicious people who are into domination, they are, they are afflicted by what Wilhelm Reich called the emotional plague, where they, you know, they, they are beaten when they're young, and they're, you know, enforced a kind of imprisoned physical structure, posture, he was brilliant about it, Wilhelm Reich, you know, he was a Freud student, but he took neurosis and, and and repression and these things, and he connected and fitted them to the neuromuscular uh, system of a, of a human being. And, um, and that, so he connected neurosis to neuromuscular armoring in a very brilliant manner. And the emotional plague is where militarist cultures, through violence, which starts in the family with violence against a child, and in sexuality, actually, with, with violence intruding into sexuality, 
especially you know pushing the male to think that's what the, that's the great thing and by by uh, the males who are the ones who are then supposed to be the soldiers and the cutthroats and the slaughterers you know and this makes them hardened where they don't feel internal empathy and sensitivity and therefore they don't feel their own inner well-being and therefore they become sadistic and weird and manipulative and because frustrated and basically miserable fantasizing that there's some well-being out somewhere in the form of status or money or dominance power and then they also become the torture and they like to kill animals and things that they like to watch them wriggle and they like to see sort of that's a life a lively you know violence produces liveliness in the victim and then this makes the person feel like better and and um, then the, his emotional play thing is so brilliant his his little pamphlet of him like it was called the emotional plague and the murder of christ there's a total classic of course, it has a it's a pamphlet, and it's has its kind of frustration of having dealt with the Russian Revolution, German the destruction of the Weimar Republic in Germany, and then coming over here and dealing with McCarthyism and and fifties uh, you know rigid uh, America. We won the war, and we we are we're the owners of the planet. You know, sort of the rigid side of America, the Pentagon side of America. So then he wrote the most play, the murder of Christ is the title. And what he meant by that was for him, Christ was a person who had conquered the emotional plague in his own body and mind. And therefore he had charisma in the real sense, charisma of person, when charisma being a kind of flowing field energy because of a great well-being feeling inside him, a blessed feeling inside him, people around him felt blessed. And so when, when he met someone with the emotional plague, on the, on the other hand, who was afraid of his own inner melting feeling, his own inner softness, his own or her own inner gentleness and blissfulness and contentment, was afraid of that, then if they, they feel that coming up inside themselves in the field of a Christ-like figure or Christ himself, and then they want to shut down that person because they subliminally, instinctually sense that what is threatening their blocks, their most neuromuscular armoring, as he called it, the armor that they wear shutting off their inner sensations, you know, is being threatened by this person. So they want to kill that person. So they want to murder Christ, you know. And, they, you know, and then males want to choke and strangle females and shut them down and imprison them, you know. Even though the melting of females is their one source of joy and pleasure in life, in that it can lead them to find their own inner melting, you know, if they when they cure themselves from the emotional play, just as Jesus undoubtedly had a nice warm relationship with Mary Magdalene that has been buried under the emotional plague attitudes of the different churches. So, so. Uh, I just got off on that, but it wasn't my intention today. My intention today is to talk about sleep. And starting with an anecdote, one time when I was uh, sort of just getting started here in Woodstock building this house, and um, I was hosting the great Tibetan doctor Yishi Dundan, who in his 90s still lives, and who was my teacher of Tibetan medicine. Uh, and who visited Menla when we were first given it uh, with his last trip to America. And he was so happy because he used to dream there would be Tibetan medicine sort of healing place in the West. And he urged me to plant lots of fruit trees. And um, we haven't had, we have, we have fruit trees, but we haven't even pruned the old ones so properly. It was, it's very slow getting it all done. And then I want to build a temple to medicine Buddha there too. But we have a temple to people in the sense that we have a wonderful spa there. Anyway, uh, a gentleman from Parabola magazine, who the late, the wonderful late William Siegel, a great person, disciple of Gurdjieff, living one of the few at that time who personally studied with Gurdjieff, who was a kind of great Buddhist in the sense of Enlightenmentist teacher, although not a card-carrying Buddhist because he was not into the denominationalism, like I'm not actually, even though I, I'm closest to a Buddha, closer formally to a Buddhist. Uh, I guess I'm a Buddhist. And um, 
but I have my idea of what it is rather than just uh, belonging to something. It is being in the refuge of being aware of the presence of the force of enlightenment in the universe, the force, you know, like the Jedi, a positive force, though, not, a, not a war force. Anyway, uh, he asked this question, you know, he set up an inter interview, had been set up for Parabola, and he was wanted to interview the Dalai Lama's personal physician and the great healer himself, Vishy Dundit. So then he says, okay, what's the first question, Bill? And he says, could you say, tell me something about sleep? And I was like, what? You have this amazing healer, great person, also a great yogi himself, and scholar of, of, of philosophy, and you're asking about sleep? I was kind of like trying to, like, don't ask that, you know, but anyway, I translated it. But the doctor wasn't thrown in the slightest, and he went into this amazing discussion of sleep. And from talking about what sleep really is, I realized I didn't actually know what it was, even though I had been doing it at that point, maybe for almost 30 years. And everybody does it every day, you have to. And some people have a hard time doing it, which is very, very, very harmful to their health. I think I had a friend in France when I was uh, younger, uh, who was a painter, very, very sort of neurotic, nervous person, but really sweet. Edil Bert Vacheron, his name, he I'm sure passed away by now. But he almost died when he, because he couldn't sleep. And I think in the 22nd day or the 17th day or the 27th day, I can't remember because I wasn't there. He told me only the story. But they somehow, they were trying all methods to get him to sleep, giving him all kinds of pills, injections, everything. He wouldn't sleep. Until finally he did, and I forgot. I forget what was the breakthrough. Maybe it was fine vintage of wine or something, uh, a dessert wine or something. I don't know what it was. Something made him finally sleep, and he survived. But they were worried he would die. He had like he was in ICU with the disease, nervous disease of him being unable to sleep, and he said it was considered fatal, lethal, lethal life threatening. So let me talk a little about sleep. Sleep, there are three phases in the normal cycle of human life, or any animal actually, because they're all the same, they're all human. Every animal is an ex-human from Buddhist point of view. Every human is an ex-animal. I mean, non-human animal. Humans are still an animal, but a non-human animal. And um, gods are animals also. Anima is the Latin word for soul. So animal means one who has a mind or a soul. Soul being just a word for subtle mind, super subtle mind. So, but anyway, humans we're talking about, because I, I hope you're human. <laughs> I said, I don't know how to talk to animals, unfortunately, they're, they're non human ones. But um, you sleep deeply, so you feel unconscious at that time, as far as your memory of the time. So you're never conscious of being unconscious, actually. You just always had a threshold of coming, going in or coming out. And then there's dreaming while sleeping, where you are conscious, although you don't know it was a dream while you're in it, unless you have developed the ability to lucid dream, or occasionally you fall into what is called a lucid dream, which just means that, wow, I'm having this experience, but I know that I'm dreaming. Without waking up, in other words, you 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 kind of wake a you degree of wakefulness or mindfulness of yourself being in a dream, and yet you're still in a dream. You're not awake, so you know your brain has reproduced in the environment that it has also reproduced, which seems like an external environment. It has reproduced a set of senses, although normally in a dream we rarely ever think of what I, what they are. Like we don't look at ourselves in a mirror in a dream and see our face. So later, when we remember the dream, we assume it was the same face we were looking out of or, or the same ears we were hearing into or hearing out of. If we smell or taste or touch, which is quite, I think, rare in a dream, but it happens. So we imagine we have that body, but we're very much not aware of that, I think. And then there's being awake. Uh, although even then in a week, it, you can, you know, this is just a, this, this useful heuristic because sometimes when you daydream when you're awake, 
you're sort of unaware of what's around you and your mind is going off on a trip into a daydream. And someone will have to shake you out of it sometimes, right? So in a way you can kind of dream while waking. And then from a Buddhist point of view, actually, when you're waking and just going along on a kind of mental inner narrative, let's say, or just swept away on, on sense stimuli, being just completely engaged in, in sense experience, then without a sort of sense of self-awareness, then you can wake and become lucidly awake, where you're also self-aware at the same time. That again takes a little effort. I think the, the mindfulness meditation craze that probably many of you who, who might be listening to this podcast might have practiced or might or certainly are aware of, uh, it really is cultivating that ability to be self-aware at the same time as aware of what's around you and, and also what's within you. So that mindfulness, what we translate as mindfulness, because in a way we're always mindful when we're awake, but it's really reflexivity. It's, uh, it's really self-remembering was a great expression of Uspensky's. It's another disciple of Gurji, the philosophical one. It's kind of a self-remembering. And the, the literal Sanskrit word that everyone translates into, Sanskrit or Pali word, as mindful as sati or smriti, means remembering. That's all it means. It's the same word for remembering. So it's like remembering while you're actually present is like remembering yourself as a being in the present. This then cultivates that different, more deeper sense of wakeful or lucid awakeness, awakeness. By the way, I'm sorry, I'm just complicating things because that's interesting, actually. And you should learn that. You should learn that you can be mindful while you're running around and doing things. And at first, when you do, um, you will feel maybe self-conscious and you will be a little slow in your dealings and you'll feel maybe this is very, you know, you almost, you could become paralyzed. What should I say now? I'm thinking and where what I'm thinking before I say or I'm not thinking before. I, you know, you get into a thing like that. You can get into a kind of recursive loops, but at first, but actually, eventually, you can be lucidly awake, much more aware of everything that you do and being aware in a more deep way and aware that you're aware at the same time, at least in your subjective sense of self, sense of yourself, and this develops into a, a more enlightened way of being and more, more vivid and more vital and vitalizing, so do think about. But anyway, that's complicating matters, I apologize. But the point is that sleeping, dreaming, and waking, these are three things in traditional yogic, either Buddhist or Hindu, or, or Vaishnavite, Vaishnavite or Shaivite, you know, because Hindu is too broad, really. There, there are different religions, really, Shaivism and Vaishnavism. <coughs> Shaktism, Goddessism. India is such a huge basket of spiritualities, you know. So they all have this kind of awareness. Sleeping, dreaming, and waking. And these connect in the larger life cycle, which is common sense reality for all these people, with dying or death, with between state, the after death state, the between death and rebirth state, and then birth, which is, goes from actual conception to death again. Not just from birth outside the womb, but birth in the womb, the entry of the soul into the seeds of the parents, which happens with the conception in the Buddhist view. And um, the Buddhist scientific view, not just uh, some uh, wishful thing, but by, by being lucidly dreaming in the between state, so bardo or between state, which great, when you have a greater level of mindfulness or self-awareness or lucid awareness, then you will be lucid through the death and rebirth process you can. And this enables you actually to choose your rebirth location, uh, which is their idea of reincarnation. That's really, what in, in Buddhist lingo, we call that reincarnation. Ordinary impulse and instinct-driven rebirth on pure impulse with no control is called rebirth. So reincarnation is like a more conscious thing. But unconscious is driven to grab new life. 
and therefore endangered of grabbing a form of life one will not like once one grabs it, has grabbed it, and it's to grab you, which is that they worry about it in, the, in, in cultures that have Buddhist biology, that feel that's sort of commonsensical, Buddhist biology is commonsensical. They do not feel that materialistic, scientific materialism is commonsensical. It is a useful scientific approach to learn certain things, to manipulate certain things, but it's not really common sense, they feel. Because it's it, common sense, we know we have minds, because we are minds, and we know that. Even though it may, we may not think that our minds are what we think they are, when we really investigate them, but we still know that we have them. So dreaming. Dr. Nida, my dear friend, Dr. Nida Chenaksang, who I consider the reincarnation of um, Yutok, Yandin Gompo the Younger, who's also a Ngakpa, a kind of um, Tibetan Buddhist shaman, uh, what they call Ngakpa, Mantri, it means, and a great uh, Nyingma Ati Yoga or Dzogchen practitioner and a great scholar of medicine and literature and things, really wonderful guy. He teaches a wonderful thing called dream yoga, which he does here and there, and sometimes at our Men Law Center in Phoenicia, New York. And uh, he's really good about this. And he told me one story that I really like about someone who finally sort of lucidly dreamed, a, a person who was having a great deal of difficulty sleeping, a Tibetan person, because he, every time he would sleep, he would have this recurring nightmare. And in the nightmare, this sort of demonic, really harsh, like, you know, demonic cannibal kind of horror movie kind of character would be chasing him. And he would be frantically scrambling through jungles and forests and icy landscapes, different kinds of places, to get away from this demon. And then he would wake up, and so he didn't want to fall asleep because then he'd be getting chased again because it was recurring. And this went on for months and months, and he was getting haggard and unhealthy and sick. And finally, he went to a doctor who was also a Nakba, Dr. Nida, like a guy like Dr. Nida. And the um, doctor had tried giving him potions and medicines and things, but it didn't work. Dietary things for sleeping. Bone soup is considered a very good thing, organic clean yak bones, that is, with the marrow, you know. But um, none of it worked. So he finally said to him, look, you just have to, what you, the, in the dream, obviously this is some sort of a karma you have, you have to just turn around, stop running away, face that demon, and something might change. You have to somehow will yourself, next time it happens, or eventually in one of those running away dreams, you turn and face that demon. So the guy said, Okay, he tried, 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 he, he just kept having them waking up. And then finally, in one dream, he managed to loose, make it lucid by creating a strong intention at the time of falling asleep. Okay, I'm going to face that demon this time. He did, he whirled around, he stood right in front of the demon, stopped in front of him. He says, why are you chasing me? And the demon said, I don't know, it's your dream. <laughs> Isn't that fun? I'm sorry, I shouldn't laugh at my own jokes, but it's not really my jokes, Dr. Nidas. I think it's a probably a well-known Tibetan story, probably, but I heard it from him. But it's, isn't it wonderful? I don't know why I'm chasing you, it's your dream. That's really cool. So, now, here I also, I have to recommend, I'm not plugging it. You can get it for a few bucks on, on and Kindle. Or you can copy it or download it from the Russians or something, probably. But my translation of Book of the Dead, uh, so Tibetan Book of the Dead, so-called, wrongly called, but anyway, that's what it's known as, uh, the study that I have of death in the beginning of that, I think is, I'm still, I think, I'm sorry to say, it's the best treatment 